So the battery switch on this boat is here. Uh, in normal operation, you just turn it one click, so that goes to the on position. Um, the boat has two batteries on it. Uh, this brain or this switch has a little brain inside of it, uh, so it's designed that when the engine's running, it automatically connects the two batteries to charge them both. But then when the engine shut off, it automatically separates the two batteries. So the idea behind that is that if the if you had the batteries on and you accidentally killed one, uh, this switch would protect you from killing both of them. There is a second position on the switch. If you look close enough, it says combined batteries down there. Um, so if the electronics started to dim in there or the engine wouldn't crank, you can go a second click. Uh, that ties the two batteries together, overrides the brain uh, for an emergency start. But the risk is if you accidentally put the switch on combined, it'll let you kill both batteries too. So, um, anyways, long story short is unless something is wrong, you always run it in the on position. The, uh, and there's a note about that here on the door. There's also a breaker in here for the windlass. Uh, that's the anchor winch up front. If that was to, were to pop, you'd see that little yellow tab comes out to reset it. Uh, you just put that lever back in and you're back in business. There's also a couple other breakers in here. They're labeled. Uh, so there's a main one for the cabin electronics. So if everything in there went black, I uh, check that. Then one for the trim tabs and one for the two bilge pumps in the back. We'll uh, take you guys inside here. Well, you might think they're easiest. So there's uh, two screens on the boat. Uh, if they don't come on automatically with the batteries, you can press and hold the power button to turn them on. Uh, these are going to take a second to warm up, so we'll come back to them. There is a set of breakers over here. Uh, they're all labeled, so the unused one's unused. The next one's the wiper. If you push that forward, you get just the driver's wiper. Uh, if you push it back, you get both wipers. If you have to watch out, there's a note on the door. Um, you want to make sure that that passenger wiper is shut off before you open the door. Otherwise, they'll collide and that'll uh, strip out the motor on that. There's one here labeled bilge. Uh, so this boat's got two automatic bilge pumps in the back. They're designed that if they see water, they automatically come on and pump it out. But if you discover that wasn't happening, uh, you can push that forward and that just turns the pump on all the time. The uh, risk with that though is that once you've hit the switch, uh, it'll run until it either kills the battery or burns the pump up. So uh, make sure that's not pressed forward unless you mean for it to be. On the lower row, lower row, uh, unused is unused. The fish box pump uh, pumps out that fish box in the back of the deck. Uh, lights are the cabin lights in here, and then the horn is the horn. And then uh, I don't think we've touched on nav lights up top. Uh, so forward is the nav lights, not much of an issue in Alaska in the summer, but they're here. And then if you rock it down, you get the anchor light. Um, if we get, there's no forecast in the fog tomorrow, but if you had fog, I'd just keep the nav lights on all the time for today. Uh, the trim tabs are here. That's like uh, flaps on an airplane, so you can adjust the boat side to side and up and down. Uh, these, this size and style of boat usually runs quickest and most efficient the farther you can get the bow up. Um, but if you're in a, if you're in a head seat, you can put the bow down some that'll help you cut through the waves. These raiders also uh, run best with the engine trimmed up a little bit. So they tend to be bow down just in general. Uh, so if you get the engine all the way down and then come up a couple seconds, uh, that'll help raise your bow up. And, the uh, start the engine, make sure you got it down first, then uh, just turn the key. There's a primer bulb for this back there, we can take a look at later. Uh, these newer engines usually don't need the primer, but if you needed it, it's back there. Then the uh, fuel gauge comes on with the switch. The, uh, so the, see we got some different marks for what full actually is on here. You'll never get it all the way up to the F, but um, this is as full as we can get it, so try and get it back better when you return it. Uh, the fuel fill is on the port side. We'll take a look at that later on. Um, and then you have to watch out. This thing will only read accurately when the boat is stopped and relatively flat. When it's up and running, it basically just reads full all the time. Uh, these two screens. So what I typically do is I'll use this larger one for navigation and then use the smaller one for a fish finder. Um, each screen can do both, so if one went out, you could use the other one for both. Um, start from scratch here. 
So when it comes on with the battery, it automatically goes to the chart, but if you'd push the power button to turn it on, uh, this would be the home screen that would come up. So we'd go to charts, uh, navigation chart is the easiest to read. Uh, and that brings up this image here. Anytime the screen is uncentered from the boat, this option to stop panning will come up. Uh, so to get the screen recentered on the boat, you hit that and then it locks on you and it will refresh with your movement. It zooms in and out just like a phone. Um, touch screen on this one. The center boat icon is you. Um, so as you move the boat around, you'll see that move around the screen. Uh, just real generally on here, uh, blue is shallow water and white is deep water. So what I try and do when I'm running a boat out of Homer is to just keep the boat in the white all the time. Uh, there are some rocks and reefs and stuff you have to watch out for, but those will typically all be surrounded by an area of blue. Mm -hmm. um, the way they mark rocks on here, or they use this little asterisk mark. Mm -hmm. um, so it's okay to be in the blue, if you need to be, that's fine, but just make sure you're zoomed in really well on yourself so that you can mm -hmm. pick and choose where you go. Uh, fairly frequently we'll see it other runners track lines that run right through those rocks and I think what they're doing is running with the screen zoomed way out and when you're that far out you know it just disappears basically uh, if you want to navigate to a specific spot on the chart uh, you can just touch that spot and it comes up with the option to navigate to and then go to and it'll draw you a beeline straight to it you have to watch out though there's no intelligence when it draws that line so it'll run you over mm -hmm rocks and reefs and everything. Uh, just make sure even if you're following the GPS line that you're still paying attention to where you're going. To exit away from that line, uh, you hit menu and it comes up with the option to stop navigation. That uh, brings you back to here. We've, uh, so customers have put some halibut spots in here. We've put some halibut spots in here. Um, we can look at fishing stuff specifically at the end of all this. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is the stuff we've entered is labeled with this little orange goldfish. Um, so if you're looking for something that we talk about on the chart later, you'd, you'd be looking for the goldfish, essentially. Um, this other one is not a touch screen, uh, so use the button controls to run it. Um, so the home page on this looks like that. So if we're going to use it as a fish finder, we go down to sonar, and then when you hit select on here, it's the equivalent of like return on a keyboard. So sonar, then traditional is the easiest one to read, and that brings up this image. The, uh, if you want to use this as a chart plotter, you can. For, if that one went out, for instance, um, to get back there, you go home, then charts, and then navigation chart is the easiest one to read. Um, hit select on that. If you want to navigate to a specific spot on here, uh, you just put the cursor where you want to go, then hit select, comes up with the op same option, navigate to, then go to. Draws that beeline, and then to get rid of it, you hit menu, um, and stop navigation will clear it back out. Uh, we got a window fan up here. Uh, so this gray button on the front of it runs it. Uh, so to start it, hit it once, then it's got three different speeds, and the fourth time you push it, shuts it all the way off. Uh, that'll tilt down and around as you need it. There are three VHF radios on here. Uh, so what I typically do is use this one, and then the other two are just as backups. Um, to turn these radios on, uh, you press and hold the red power button, it uh, gets you turned on, then the volume knob is up top and the squelch knob is on the bottom. The way the squelch works, so that adjusts the sensitivity of the radio, uh, so to get it on its maximum sensitivity, you turn the squelch counterclockwise until it squelches, and then up just enough to silence it as your maximum receptor count. This, uh, these two are also linked into the GPS. Uh, so they read out your GPS position here all the time. Uh, so if you had to do a Coast Guard call or you wanted to know where you're at, that's your latitude launch too. These two are also linked into, uh, they have a distress feature on them. So this little red flap says distress. Uh, if you hit that button, then it comes up with instructions on the screen on how to send out a, a distress call through the radio waves. That's kind of a new thing up here, but uh, it's a pretty neat one. So that sends a signal out just to everybody in radio range so essentially to all of the nearest boats um, and it will take over their radio turn it to a channel turn the volume all up and it actually plots a course from where they're at straight to you so um we always worry a little bit if there's a real emergency that people would just use you know just rely on the radio or just rely on the ear but um, anytime there's an emergency you want to use everything you've got cell phones flare guns e-perf and radio so um 
that's it on those guys. If you want to listen to the weather on these, uh, you can hit any of these three top buttons and then it will, and you can scroll over. WX stands for weather. If you hit that. Then uh, channel two is our local weather on here. And one thing you gotta watch out for once you've switched over to these weather frequencies, you can't get back to channel 16 or any frequency you can transmit on unless you hit this 16 button. So you're trapped in the weather frequencies essentially. Uh, so then we got this other radio. Um, this one has its own built-in battery. The idea with that is that if the boat batteries died, uh, you can still use that for a call out and it has the, the on and volume switch there. Uh, in this glove box, we got a label. So there's a flare gun in there, a first aid kit, binoculars, there's zip ties to redo the anchor breakaway up front. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and a tide book. We also keep a little packet, just band aids and aspirin type stuff down there. Uh, we ask that you take stuff out of there first before you break into first aid in case something just needs first aid. It's all there someday. Uh, there's a porta potty underneath this step. Um, you're welcome to use that. If you do, please just clean it out. Uh, the Coast Guard's fact is that has to be emptied at least three miles offshore. They don't really enforce that tightly, but you wouldn't want to come back in the harbor and be dumping it. Um, and it's kind of a pain to clean out, so most people prefer to use the bucket if your crew will go along with that. Uh, inside these two seat boxes, they're labeled. Uh, so there's eight adult life jackets in here. Um, plus four kids life jackets, as well as a pump for the raft up top. In this other one are two downriggers. Uh, there's also a cable work box in there, so that has the manuals for all the engines, electronics, everything. Nobody looks at it, but it's there. And then there's some tools, one other thing. Oh, and cleaning supplies in there also. Uh, there's two fire extinguishers on this boat. Uh, they're both be one behind each uh, helm chair. They've both got a label there, if you look at them. And then underneath the paper towels is our throwable PFD. Um, so if the Coast Guard checks, they'd want to see a uh, throwable PFD. You can also use that as a booster seat if you have trouble seeing on the bow or up on step. Uh -huh. Then if you guys want to step out on the dock and meet here on the bow, you dangerous thing people do in Cook Inlet. Uh, Cook Inlet's got the big, big tides. There's stories about people who dropped anchor and it starts to pull the boat under. Um, so we, this is a bigger boat, we wouldn't expect that to happen, but we keep a dedicated anchor knife up here all the time, and if you get in trouble with the anchor, uh, sometimes your best odds are to cut the anchor line and just start over. The, uh, there's about 300 feet of anchor line and about 20 feet of chain. Uh, we rig the anchor with a zip tie here. That's meant to be a sacrificial breakaway. Uh, so the idea is if you get the anchor stuck in the bottom, you pull hard enough, hopefully you can get that zip tie to break, and then that pulls the anchor out in reverse. Um, those are the zip ties that are in the glove box if you need to do more. There's a couple notes on this winch. Um, this thing uses quite a bit of electricity, so I always try and start the main engine before I run it so that the, the batteries are charging while you're using it. And then you want to make sure you only anchor off the bow. So uh, a couple of people had killed themselves a few years ago. They anchored on the stern and pulled the boat into the waves and tide and went down rapidly. Um, to use this winch, uh, you bring the line across the top first. I usually wrap it twice. Um, and then when you step on this foot switch and pull, it'll engage the line and lift. Uh, that'll only pull the rope portion when you get to the chain. You have to pull that by hand. Uh, I just watched, we had a couple of people that forgot to flip the lid up and they said the winch didn't work, but uh, it'll go. <laughs> and the, uh, this thing sounds horrible, so it's mounted on this big aluminum drum, essentially. Um, but that's how they sound new, and I don't know what to tell you on that. No. Um, I'll take you back to the back of the boat. this year uh, if you want to troll on it or as a secondary propulsion we got it to lower it down there's a gray lever down here press that down 
and then when you lift up and release it'll drop the engine down into place. Uh, this one's set up, it's got a manual pull start or an electric start if you push the button. Um, it has to be in neutral before it'll let you start it, it has to be idled all the way down before it'll let you shift. This one doesn't have any sort of choke system to it, so you just hit the button and it automatically chokes. But there is a primer ball for it here if you find that it has a tough time to start. Uh, to bring it back up, you pull that lever up, then lift, and it will lock into place. And then to shut it down, press and hold that red button. This main engine uh, also has a Easy troll plate on it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, but if you uh, look down there, it's that silver plate. So if you pull this rope, that plate will drop down into place, and it's designed to block some of the prop wash. You can troll more slowly. Um, so if you wanted to do that, um, you've got an instruction mark here. You just pull this, and then it drops down into place to troll. Then to get it back up, um, you'd have to have somebody back here to pull on that, and then as you throttle the boat up, the prop wash will kick that plate up into place and you release that and it locks. Um, that can be kind of a rodeo sometimes, um, depending on your communication between who's driving and who's up there. Um, if you run into trouble with that, you can just pull on that and reach down there with a gaff or a brush and lift, physically lift it up into place. Um, and then if that really fights it, you can tilt the engine up and do the whole thing. So shut off, of course. The uh, two bilge pumps are underneath these two ports here. Uh, this boat's designed with self-bailing decks, so the, theoretically if water gets on the deck, uh, it's made to drain off on its own. If you found out that wasn't happening or that these weren't coming on, uh, you can open these up, reach down there, and if you had to clear out like the basket on the, the bilge pump, this is where you would access it. We're getting closer here. The uh, key perp is up here. Uh, so that's an emergency beacon. That's triggered. It sends out a distress signal in your location. Coast Guard. Uh, there's instructions here on how to access it. Basically, you twist the blue dial, lift the lid off, and then you can pull the unit out uh, and hit activate on it and start transmitting. Uh, same deal as we talked about with the radio, though. Uh, we always worry that somebody would activate that and just sit there waiting. But uh, if you have a real emergency, use everything you got. So, uh, that distress button, radio call, e for flare gun, um, and cell phones works most of most of what we can say here. Uh, there are four halibut rods and reels, two salmon rods and reels. Uh, there's a gaff that fits in the handle for the harpoon plug here. The uh, harpoon tip and line are in here. Uh, there's a manual bilge pump if the battery has died and you need to get water out. A couple flashers for trolling, uh, downrigger balls and clips, and then a uh, halibut sinkers there as well. And might uh, run you through this downrigger real quick. Um, so there's two of them on board, the other one's still in the seat box, but I pulled this one out so we can take a look at it. To operate these can of downriggers, uh, to let line out, you just start to unscrew the handle and it'll go. Um, this handle is essentially like a clutch on a car, so the farther you take it, the faster it goes. Um, so if you wanted to slow the ball down, you'd start to crank forward again, and that slows you down. When you get it down to the depth you want it, uh, you just start to reel up and that locks it. Um, and that's how you lift it back up. It has a little manual counter on it here. Uh, these counters can be pretty glitchy. If you find that the depth is way off on it, uh, you can disengage it from the gear and then spin it by hand to zero it back out. Um, then if you want to pivot it, uh, pull that and it lets you pivot around. And then to put it on and off, uh, you unscrew that screw there to let you slide it back out. So that is it on downriggers. Um, I think that's it. So that's our 24-foot Raider. Raider.